Melvin Newland tells the story of picking up a friend at the airport, attempting to locate his friend among all the passengers who were arriving. He noticed a single man standing in the jetway. He was carrying two bags, and he was walking in his general direction. In fact, he stopped rex ne right next to Newland to greet his family. In Newland's words, this is what happened. First, he motioned to his younger son, perhaps six years old, as he set down his bags. They gave each other a long, loving hug as they separated just enough to look at each other's face. I heard the father say, it is so good to see you, son. I missed you so much. His son smiled somewhat shyly and responded softly, yeah, dad, me too. Then the son stood up and gazed into the eyes of his older son, now perhaps nine or ten, while cupping his son's face in his hands, he said, you know, you are really becoming the young man. I love you very much, Zach. And they too engaged in a long and tender hug. While all this was happening, a baby girl in her mother's arms was squirming excitedly in the direction of her father, never taking her eyes off him. The man finally said, hi, baby girl, and took the child gently from her mother. He quickly kissed her face and then hold, held her to her, his chest. The little girl instantly relaxed and laid her head on his shoulder, motionless in pure contentment. After several moments, he handed his daughter to the older son and declared, I've saved the best for last, and proceeded to give his wife the longest kiss that Melvin Newland said he could remember. He gazed into her eyes for several moments and then silently mouthed the words, I love you so much. They stared at each other's eyes, beaming big smiles at one another, still holding hands, and for an instant they reminded me of newlyweds, though I knew by the age of the children that could not be the case. I puzzled about it for a moment and then realized, embarrassed, how totally engrossed I was in this display of unconditional love that was happening but an arm's length away from me. Ah, the power of love. I told Dr. Bell yesterday that I didn't know why I had awakened to the lyrics of Huey Lewis and the new song, The Power of Love, and then it occurred to me, the power, power of love, different, different kind of love, but, but the power of love is where we must begin with this examination of John 3. More powerful than anything else in this chapter is the love of God, which is to us in Jesus Christ our Lord. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Of course, no human example, however dramatic or beautiful, compares to God's love. The love of God is personal, like the reunion of a father and child, a husband and wife. The love of God is compelling, sometimes literally stopping people in their tracks. But the love of God is larger than anything that we human beings are able to do. It was the Apostle Paul who said, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, and all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. How great is the love of Christ? Nothing shall separate us from it, not death nor life, not angels nor demons, even the powers of hell cannot keep God's love away. Whether we are high as the skies or as deep as the oceans, nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The love of God, so great, the power of love. Now understand that this power turns on a single English word, 
so. So is so short a word, it probably doesn't even appear in the crossword puzzles. So. It's, it's not even a noun. A noun would be the, the president, the baseball player, the, the justice, Congress, police. Could be anything. Nouns name people, places, and things. So is not a noun. So is not even a verb. A verb does something, except for those intransitive verbs, be and is, you know, that stuff. But those transitive verbs, which do something, they, they go, they act, they jump, they play, they swim. So is not even one of those. It's a modifier. It tells us how much, in great quantity, how, how greatly something happens. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. When you have small children, you play this game. You ask them, who loves you? The appropriate response may be mommy or daddy or grandma or grandpa. Mommy loves me, but there's another question. How much does mommy love you? I've seen it happen a hundred times. The child gets this incredibly curious, even mischievous look on his face and says, mommy loves me so much. And of course, the wording is accompanied by arms outstretched as wide as they can possibly go. Makes sense when you're a kid. Makes sense when you're a parent. I hope we never outgrow feeling that way. But we have a chance to take our understanding of love to an entirely new level. Who loves us? Why, God loves us. How much does God love us? Maybe instead of spreading our arms so wide, we open our Bibles to John chapter 3. We let our fingers fall to the 16th verse, and for the umpteenth time, we read words we can never shake. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Ah, the power of love, the power of God's love. But do you know what? There, there's more to the story. It's not merely about the fact of God's love. There is the reason for God's love, his motive in loving us. God's motive for loving us is that we might have life. We live in a day when everybody's motives tend to be suspect, no one in government has any motive other than political. Financial gain is one of the driving forces and motivations of our world today. Oh, look at the stock market. Well, everything is financial. Yeah, everybody's out for gain. That's the only motive. We, we have people who make a living listening to speeches so they can tell us what the speakers really said and what their motives truly were. They get behind the words to the motivation, and, and motives are important. I don't deny that. There is a good reason we have this phrase in our vocabulary, ulterior motive. People do things for less than right reasons. We see it happen. But what about God? Verse 17 tells the tale, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God's love constitutes a mission of mercy. Jesus is on a mission to save. The way his love takes expression is to reach out to us a saving hand that we might live. God's motive in loving us is that we might have life. A lot of people have misconceptions about God. Human beings have rather spectacularly succeeded in imagining God in their own image. Anytime you hear someone say, but, but I, I can't believe God would, or, or, or surely God wouldn't expect, or oh, God wouldn't ask that of me, or something like that, you know, somebody is rationalizing away what he has heard about God. He or she is reinventing God to fit his or her own concept of what God should look like, repackaging God telling God how he would be if God were only as smart as he were. We've been doing it for centuries. 
In fact, almost 100 years ago, Albert Schweitzer wrote a, wrote a book on the subject. It's such a significant book that 111 years after first publication, it's still in print, Quest for the Historical Jesus. He was trying to do one thing. He was proving that unless we pay better attention to the scriptures, our pictures of Jesus will end up looking like us. He looked at a bunch of biographies of Jesus. He examined the thinking of the authors, and this is what he concluded. Unless we are very careful, our picture of Jesus will end up looking less like what the Bible has portrayed and more like our idea of the perfect human being. In other words, we will have missed the point. But we don't need a God who is just like us, only a little better. We can't use a Savior who is just like us, only a little better. God is dramatically different. God's love encompasses the whole world. God has a motive which cannot be questioned. He loves us so much that we have a chance to possess life. We don't need commentary this morning. We need hardcore truth. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. There's your motive. The power of love, the motive of love. How about the consequence of love? Verse 18, there is no judgment awaiting those who trust him, but those who do not trust him have already been judged for not believing in the Son of God. God didn't love us for the fun of it, he loved us so we might deal with the issues of sin and death and hell. He loved us for eternal reasons, and the consequences of his love are eternal. But wait, somebody has spotted the offensive word in those verses. The word is judgment. I, I don't believe in judgment, someone will offer. Loving God couldn't sentence his children to judgment. Another will say, can't we just get along, uh, all of us? What is this business of judgment anyway? Those thoughts are out there. They are commonly expressed. But I would remind you of two things. One, it doesn't matter how often something is said. If it isn't true, it isn't true. It doesn't matter who endorses it or how many people believe it. If it's not true, it's not true. God doesn't let us off the hook. We have a choice to make, and the choice is about life or death. It was given once for man to live, and then comes the judgment. That's the simple fact of the matter. Look it up. And here's the other thing. Judgment is not God's aim here. Saving us is his aim. We've read verses 16 and 17. The purpose of God is to bring men and women, boys and girls, into the saving grace of Jesus. Nothing could be simpler or plainer or more important. But when we do not trust Jesus, we do something to ourselves. We walk farther and farther out onto the gangplank of death. And the banners over that gangplank read... Sin, death, hell. God is doing everything to save us. He sent his only son to save us. He watched his son die on a cross to save us. He was resurrected from the grave to save us. He didn't come to judge the world. He came that the world through him might be saved. If we say no, God's judgment falls. Not because he wants to pronounce it. He does not but because he will not force us into his kingdom, because love is like that. Now return with me to the airport. You remember the airport, where we left the young family in reunion? Melvin Newland goes on with his story. Having watched this family re reunite, he said, I realized I had become uncomfortable. It was as if I were invading sacred space but I was amazed to hear my own voice nervously ask, wow, how long have you two been married? 12 years was the reply. Well then, he asked, 
how long have you been away? The man turned and replied to him, huge smile emanating from his face, two whole days. <laughs> two days? He was stunned by the intensity of the greeting. He assumed that he'd been gone for weeks, perhaps months. I knew my expression betrayed me, he said. And then he said almost offhandedly, hoping to end the intrusion with some semblance of grace, I hope my marriage is that passionate after the same length of time. The man suddenly stopped smiling. He looked me dead in the face, he said, and with a forcefulness that burned into my soul and with words I have been unable to forget, he said, don't hope, my friend, decide. Then he flashed me that wonderful smile again, shook my hand and said, God bless. With that, he and his family walked away and I was still watching them when my friend for whom I had been waiting arrived and asked, what in the world are you looking at? Without hesitating and with a curious sense of certainty, I replied, I'm looking at my future. Love does amazing things. The love of God truly does amazing things, revolutionary things, life-transforming things. The Bible says so. The history of believers says so. And every one of us who has said to, yes to Jesus says so. And so it becomes a matter for us to decide. Not just to hope, hope is an element of what we believe, but to decide where we stand in terms of a relationship with God. Saying yes to Jesus who gave all for us, whom God sent to be the sacrifice and savior for us, or to condemn ourselves. This morning's hymn of invitation is number 501, and as God would lead you, I invite you to come with your commitment to him. Let's stand together as we sing. Oh, Jesus, I have promised. <laughs>